Let's go to our preaching time. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6. Jeremiah, chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 10 through 19. Jeremiah 6. And let's begin there with verse 10. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others, with their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear, ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. The Lord says in verse 19, This people, that's going to be Judah, have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. This begins with what he said back in verse 10. Their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. When the Bible speaks of a circumcised ear or a circumcised heart, it simply means an ear ready to hear what God says, or a heart ready to receive what God offers. But because of their wicked condition, he says at the end of verse 10, they have no delight in it, that is, in the words of God. How many Christians would that describe today? Probably far too many. They're not drawn to the Word of God, the Bible, like they once were. They're interested in what trendy fad their local Christian bookstore is offering. They're interested in Joel Osteen's joke of the week, the surprise is, Joel is the joke of the week. The Bible says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing, Acts 17, verse 21. And then God says in verse 11, Therefore, as because of their indifference, I am full of the fury of the Lord. And when he brings it upon a wayward nation, it will fall on husbands and wives, on the young and old alike. God won't discriminate when he sends judgment. Then the Lord declares in verse 13, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. Covetousness, as wanting what someone else has, is fueled by envy, and it leads to greed. The last, the tenth commandment is still, Thou shalt not covet, Exodus 20, verse 17. Seeking to enrich yourself or to enhance your own image or your reputation without regard to others is what uh, destroys lives, it destroys culture, it ruins entire nations. Greed, envy, covetousness. You know what? This country is nearly $20 trillion in debt right now. Lawmakers worry about their place in the history books while they borrow and spend their children's futures away. 
The flesh of man can never be satisfied. The more you get, the more you want. The more you have, the more you think you need. You have a 40-inch uh, flat-screen television. You want a 60-inch flat-screen television. If you drive an Infiniti, you want to drive a Mercedes. If your church has 100 members. You think you need 500 members. If you have 500 members, you think you need 1,000. Joel Osteen's father, John Osteen, had a church with 800 members coming regularly. Uh, when he died, Joel was made the new pastor. All Joel was doing was he was a camera operator for their TV ministry. That was Joel's preparation for the ministry. He was a, t he was a TV camera uh, operator. And the church board of elders or uh, deacons, they elected him to be the new pastor. And he took it from 800 to 40,000 people showing up at his sports arena uh, church each Sunday. But uh, covetousness leads to another phenomenon, verse 13. For from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. That is, the ministers or the clergy of the day say what people want to hear, not what people need to hear. There's a great difference between what people want to hear and what they ought to hear or what they need to hear. And they compromise the Bible. They compromise the gospel. They compromise sound doctrine. They compromise biblical instruction, every propriety that, that's consistent with holy living, a holy Christian life. God may save you just as you are. But it doesn't mean he wants you to stay just as you are. Eventually, there needs to be some sign of growth, some sign of fruit that's evident that God has saved you, God, the Holy Spirit lives within you, and God's bringing about some sense of conviction to your heart and your mind and your thoughts and your actions and your behavior and your conduct over time. When none of that seems to be manifest, then you have to wonder if someone truly got saved or not. At least it's fair for us to ask the question, did God really save you and did he change you at all? And the scriptures tell us why people are, are in the, the uh, and their preachers are this way. Why they're in the condition that they're in. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The sneaky conniving nature of man is always at work. Uh, the book of Jude, verse 16, says, These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. As men seeking to advance themselves and to enrich themselves and to elevate and promote themselves, no matter how rotten they have to become in the, in the process. That's sort of the... the Wealth and prosperity preachers gospel. God wants to make you rich, but he wants you to make me rich first. That's the way it goes. I was watching something uh, the other night on the internet, and they were estimating the, the uh, uh, total wealth, uh, the accumulated wealth, or the, uh, oh, what's the right word for it? Um, the, net, the net worth, I'm sorry, that's, that's the term I meant. The net worth of some of these uh, well-known television ministers. And I won't bore you with some of the details of the different ones on their list, but they went from, I think, the top 20 television ministers and what their net worth was. And they included Billy Graham, because Billy Graham's been in the public eye for 60 years, and his net worth was about $20 million. Actually, it was far less than I would have expected. He'd been preaching for 60 years and well-known all over the world. I would think that his uh, total net worth was far more than that. But Kenneth Copeland has a net worth of over $750 million. His mansion, his so-called ministry facilities, his private jets, and all of the other things that he has, some printing enterprises and so forth, and uh, he wants to be rich. He boasts of his wealth and uh, flaunts it in front of his church members and they celebrate it and think God's going to do the same for me too one day. No, he's not. You're a sucker. 
2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4 say, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. The truth is, people are lazy in their spiritual studies, lazy in the scriptures, and they want to believe silly things. They want to believe silly things. Now, the Bible says that the things written in the Old Testament were written for our learning, Romans 15, 4, and for our admonition, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. So we don't hesitate to go to the Old Testament for learning and for admonition. And the conditions found in Jeremiah's day didn't change much over time. They were still true when Christ walked this earth. He told the priests in the temple that is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves, Matthew 21, 13. And he said in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Later in the Apostle John's day, God reproved the church of Laodicea, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Revelation 3, verse 17. And you know from studying the Bible and Bible prophecy, if you know anything about Bible prophecy, you have to admit that the day of Laodicea is now. Those conditions are the order of the day today. At, at no other time in church history have there been so many mega churches boasting 2,000 to 20,000 people showing up every Sunday. You know, the two largest churches in the United States are both in the city of Houston. There's the Joel Osteen's circus, uh, 40,000 people showing up every Sunday. And then the Second Baptist Church, Baptists have always broken themselves into First Baptist, Second Baptist. Whoever got to that town first could lay claim to First Baptist Church name. But there's a Second Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, and they have 20,000 people that attend each week. But uh, supersized crusades that fill football stadiums and sports arenas, churches with slick marketing campaigns and uh, audio video production, advertising budgets that could feed a small country if they had to. While their sizes are very impressive, the spiritual lives of their members are very often disappointing. They just go from one excitement, one thrill, to the next excitement, the next thrill. Week after week after week, this is all they live for. What's going to happen at church this week? It's promoted as though it were a, a circus or some um, event taking place uh, out in the baseball field where, you know, jugglers are going to be juggling and people are going to be telling jokes and there's going to be someone shot out of a cannon and so forth. This is about the, the, the level of spirituality that most of these mega churches uh, possess. They're so spiritually shallow, you couldn't get your ankles wet. And because they've got themselves into this condition, God says, I am full of the fury of the Lord there in verse 11. That's God saying that he's fed up with something. You don't want to get the Lord God mad. It's good to be on the good terms with the Lord. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you're saved and you know him by faith in the new birth, you belong to him. He'll still take a, take a paddle to you. He'll st still spank you if necessary. You don't want to get on the bad side of the Lord God of the Bible. But the Lord says how today's church, just like ancient Judah, could fix their problem. Uh, and that's the heart of my sermon today. Verse 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see... And ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. So uh, that's all introduction. Let's get to the sermon. And I call this simply, Hey there, Grandpa. I thought about calling it Old Guy's Rule. And the older I'm getting, the more I can identify with the expression. 
But uh, point number one is this. Stand in the way and see. If you want to learn anything, you have to go where that information uh, is to stand in the way where the knowledge travels. If you want to improve your English skills, your English usage skills, signing up for a math class at a junior college is probably not the best way to go about it. Uh, math class is not the place to stand if you want to learn more about English usage. You have to enroll in an English class because that's where the English knowledge uh, is being taught. Once you stand in the right place, then you have to see, open your eyes to the instruction. You won't learn very much about correct uh, sentence structure, syntax, uh, and usage by simply osmosis. It won't come into your brain by the molecules in the air. If you want to learn more about English, uh, just being in the classroom will help very little, unless you listen to the instruction, open your textbook, and actually do the work. I, can't I, I cannot attend church for somebody else. I can't read their Bible for them. God expects them to do it. God expects you to do it. God expects me to do it. And um, if you want to learn and grow in the knowledge of the Word of God, you have to go, first of all, where it's believed, and then secondly, where it's taught. Either one of those uh, factors without the other will profit you very little. Go where it's believed and where it's taught. Learning is almost always brought about by getting instruction from someone who has been studying it longer than you have and understands it more than you have and can then explain it to you. You might be able to teach yourself uh, English. If you have a basic knowledge of reading, then you begin reading books on English usage, proper sentence structure, understanding the difference between verbs and nouns and adjectives and so forth. But uh, it'll come to you more quickly if you send under a good English instructor or maybe some other student who's taken the course before you and is able to, to then tutor you. But fortunate, and fortunately, the English language, using it as an example, the English language has been adopted as sort of the universal language around the world in commerce and in politics and so forth. So the, the rules and the structure of English usage, usage are fairly well set. By the way, since I'm using this as an illustration, I understand that there are people who watch our videos in Korea and watch my sermons in Korea to hear English spoken and maybe help them in their English usage. The joke's on them. I don't speak it that well. But um, everything you want to know is already out there. And uh, in the old paths of language and literature, you have to ask someone to show you where to look, where to find it, how to find it, how to understand it. And to make a fair spiritual application of this idea would be that if you want to learn the Bible, you have to go and sit under someone else who's been reading it, maybe studying it longer than you have, uh, or more in depth than you have, who can then help you understand it. That's just the way everything seems to work when it comes to instruction and learning. Um, I learned so much from my father sitting under his preaching when I was growing up. I learned so much from Dr. Ruckman when I went to Pensacola Bible Institute and uh, sat under his preaching and teaching. And, I, and I'm humbled that God would send people to listen to me and sit under my Bible teaching and preaching. And I pray that they learn something that is instructive to them, helpful to them. I get people complimenting me and thanking me for this or that, and I can't tell you what a humbly, humbling experience that is, and I'm grateful to it, but either I or Pastor Kim or some other pastor, if you trust them enough to ask, I'd be happy to help you find the answer. I'll tell you if I don't know the answer to that, or say, give me some time, I'll try to research that for you. But uh, take this word of advice. Don't purchase anything offered by TBN. You don't want to, you're not going to learn the Bible listening to Jan Crouch read the Living Bible on CD. 
She was another strange creature. There's an old word that's not used very often, but it uh, accurately described Jan Crouch, and that was the word floozy. You don't hear the word floozy thrown about much, but she certainly was one. Point number two today, God tells you to ask for the old paths. Ask for the old paths. The image in our text, verse, verse 16, is like that of a man who is at a fork in the road, and he is deciding which way to go. One is well-traveled and busy, and nearly everyone is going down that way. And the other one looks like it's safe enough, but very few people are taking it. It probably leads to a fine place. Uh, it looks like it's been around for a long time. And even inside, something tells you, go down that road and see what's leading down that direction. You know, in the movie, Pixar, the Pixar movie Cars, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe? And yeah, I watched it. Yeah, I saw it. Um, the, the story uh, focused on the major highway that went through the nation and bypassed the little small little roads that uh, wound their way through the country. And those little towns along that road lost tourism, they lost business, they just about dried up because everyone was taking the super highway and nobody was going the slower route. And uh, do you know something? That actually happened in America. It was called Route 66. It started back at Lake Michigan, Illinois, and wound its way all the way through the across the United States and ended up at Santa Monica Pier. And that used to be the route everybody took to drive across the country. It took you through small little towns, little strange uh, motels, roadside motels, and things that little little fruit stands and little businesses you you never would have known about uh, had you not taken that that slower route. But it wasn't straight and direct, and it wasn't as quick. Uh, so therefore, people have adopted the major freeways and interstates now, and they've forgotten about the old Route 66. You can still take it. You can still drive Route 66 and wind your way all the way through the, across the country and stop at little markets and things people are selling alongside the road that are unique and one of a kind. But, um, but very few people take that anymore. Solomon wrote, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, Proverbs 16, 25. By the way, there are probably more fatalities on the superhighway than there are in that little slow rolling road that winds through the, across the country. Jesus said, enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. By the way, Matthew 7, 14 says, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. The New King James Bible says, Straight is the gate, and difficult is the way. It's not difficult to be born again. It's not difficult to get saved. It's a very easy proposition. If you admit you're a sinner... And understand that Jesus Christ died and suffered for your sins. His righteousness can then be yours. And your sins can be put upon him. And a great spiritual transaction can take place that fast. You can become born again. But ask for the old paths. Even if they're not popular or traveled very much anymore. Even today. A lot of young people are learning the value of older things. Called the retro movement. And... Um, I know people who like old clothing styles, they like old furniture, they like old record players that played vinyl uh, albums. Most guys, most men like an old car that's been restored to its former uh, beauty and luster. And um, there's uh, old car clubs and the whole point is to buy an old car and as a hobby, fix that thing up and restore it to its brand new condition. And you and the, your other club members can then uh, glory in what you've accomplished. <laughs> Take it out to old car shows. I know a fellow, he bought a pile of parts on a trailer of a 1955 uh, Chevy Nomad wagon. And he was mechanical, but not that mechanical. So he and his brother, who had, they had bought it together. I think they bought the whole pile of parts for $2,000. 
And uh, they began to hire professionals to put it back together again. Hired professionals to do the body work, uh, engine work, uh, upholstery on the inside, electrical wiring. They replaced the old crank down, your roll down windows with power windows now and so forth. And uh, they decided to enter it into a, in a car show. And the first time they went to a car show, they took first prize. And a guy came up to them who was a collector of cars. He said, I'll give you $70,000 for that car right now. So they sold it to him, took the money. But back in 1988, Pat Robertson, the Christian Broadcasting Network, launched what they called the Family Channel, the cable network. And they didn't depend on new programs as such. All they did was go back and they got reruns from the 1950s and 1960s, clean television shows, and just repeated those. And it was an instant hit. In just a few years, they had 43 million subscribers across the nation. And they became so profitable that they were in jeopardy of losing their tax-exempt status as a Christian organization. So they sold it to the Fox Network within a couple of years, and that became the Fox Family Network. And uh, Fox sold it to Disney, became Disney Family Network, or ABC. And uh, they, Disney bought it for uh, $2.9 billion from the Fox Network. Now it's called ABC Family Network. Pat Robertson structured it in such a way that the word family has to always remain in the title. But it, I remember as that was taking place, thinking all across this nation there are people who long for the old paths. They long for times when, when things were safe, when you could, you could actually, if you watch television, you actually watch something on television and not have to cover your kids' ears or their eyes every time a commercial came on. Maybe they miss the, the, the days where you actually got up and got dressed to go to Sunday school, to go to church, where they'd hear old time singing, they'd participate in it. I don't want to sing off a big screen while the rock band is playing. Give me a hymn book and let me sing out of the book and sing with joy and sing with enthusiasm. People need to hear the old time music. They need to hear old time preaching. They need to hear the old time shout. They need to read from the old time Bible. If they're never going to get anything and get anywhere in their walk with Jesus Christ. That's what they need. They need the old paths. The old paths of honesty and honor and integrity and decency and morality and virtue, those things are all gone out the window these days. So in addition to standing in the ways to see, you and I are told to ask for the old paths. Ask for them. If some guy's got some new version of the Bible, ask him why he's not preaching out of the King James Bible. Ask him what he has, why he has a problem with the King James Bible. What does he have against it? If a guy is a, says he's a preacher, ask him, why don't you wear a suit and tie like most preachers do? That's the way the things are these days. Uh, make him defend himself. Make him defend his lackadaisical, casual attitude towards spiritual things. Point number three, he says, where the good ways are. Where the good way is, I should say. Where the good way is. If you want to learn English, back to that illustration, by enrolling in an English class, Studying diligently and making, making use of the instruction is still not enough. The problem is there are excellent English teachers and there are poor English teachers. If you get tutored by someone who knows as little as you do, then you're in trouble. And devotionally, for our, our purposes, if you're taught the Bible by someone who knows as little as you know, then both of you are lost. Neither one of you know which direction you're going in. And that's why I stated earlier, you need to find some, uh, someone who, number one, believes the Bible, and then number two, can teach it to you. One of those without the other uh, will not profit. Not just teach you his opinion, or not just what he thinks, or not what's trendy, not what somebody else said before him. What does the Bible say? How do we find the answers directly from the text of the Word of God? I went to one of these mega churches during my day job. And uh, their church bulletin, it sounded good enough. It said that we at such and such church believe in teaching God's word, equipping the believer, 
and hold the Bible as true and infallible. Well, I have no problem with that. And they also said, we believe the Bible to be the inspired, the only infallible, authoritative, inerrant word of God. That sounds great, and I believe in that too. But then I went to their church bookstore on the premises, and they had about six or seven different translations of the Bible for sale, which meant they don't believe a single word they put in that bulletin. They don't believe any single one of those Bibles is the perfect word of God and they can hold in their hands. They're all pretty much equal with one another. What if they contradict? And many of them do. They had the King James Bible and they had about seven other English translations, modern translations, and there are multiple contradictions between them. Who's to decide which one's right and which one's wrong? The truth is they don't believe any single one of those Bibles. You can't study something if you don't have it. And you can't learn the Bible if you don't have a copy of it. I'm a King James Bible believer. I don't just use it, I believe it. I don't just want to memorize it, I believe it. And when someone says, we use only the King, that doesn't impress me at all. What do you believe? What do you believe is the perfect word of God that you could actually hold in your hands? Do you believe there is such a book that you can actually hold in your hands and own a copy of? I've stood in the ways and seen that's the Bible that all the other Bibles want to be like. And I'm not afraid to ask for the old paths. Its words bring conviction to the heart. Do you know something? The, the King James Bible is what keeps a drunkard awake at night at the Union Rescue Mission. He doesn't care about Greek and Hebrew. He doesn't care about what the modern translations say. Those Bibles don't bring conviction. There's something about the text, the sound, the ring of those of the modern English on the in, the in the English ear that does not have a ring of authority. When someone says, this is what God says, and I've told you this book, that S sort of trails off into the distance. It's not like saying the word of the Lord d, with a hard consonant at the end. It rings in the ear with some measure of authority. Call that psychological, call it whatever you want to call it. But God set it up in just such a way that the English words in our Bible have the ring of authority. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Its words help to create strong men and women of faith and hope. It makes believers who know how to approach God in fear and uh, with proper respect. And then I can see that it's a, it's a good way. That book has helped to shape the English-speaking uh, races of men in the world. It's helped to shape Western civilization. And uh, the Bible represents the, our King James Bible represents the pinnacle of the language between the, uh, the covers of one book. It's been called the noblest monument of English prose. It's been called the developmental apex of the English language. And lastly, point number four, verse 16 says, Walk ye therein. Walk therein. Your long-term success in English or in math depends on you putting into practice what you learn. A math textbook would look like hieroglyphics eventually if you didn't put into practice what you've learned from it. And uh, people like me, uh, it already looks like hieroglyphics. <laughs> math was not my good subject. And so it is with your response to God's book. Judah told the Lord, we will not walk therein, in our text. What a sad response. When God asks you and tells you what to do, and you say, I'm not going to do it. But he told them, if they would, ye shall find rest for your souls. You know, a lot of what passes for Christianity is a disappointment. It's just another well-traveled highway that might get people to the end of their lives, only to discover that the peace and hope and the joy that they were hope that they were longing for never did come. All they had was religion. They had nothing real. Uh, all they had were the words of men, the, the lectionaries and the recitation of prayers and uh, counting prayers on a bee, a string of beads, or some memorized text you learned in catechism class many many years ago. Whether it's a Lutheran or the Episcopalian or Roman Catholic uh, the church. Those things cannot satisfy the soul when what you really long for is the Word of God. Robert Frost's, and I'm going to bring this to a close, his 
famous poem in 1920 called The Road Not Taken. The last stanza says, I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. If you will look to God for the old paths, the old ways of worshiping God, the old ways of approaching God, the old ways of prayer, the old ways of preaching, the old book, the old music, the old shout, the old gospel, the old time religion, God will bless. God will bless. That's where God wants you to go. He says, seek, ask for the old paths. 